Joe for the invitation. Um, many of you will remember that in 2006, the former U.S. Uh, Vice President Al Gore made a film entitled uh, The uh, Inconvenient Truth. And the eponymous truth to which he wanted to draw our attention at that time was that it's entirely possible to be bang in the middle of the crisis, bang in the middle of a crisis, and in the case of the movie, environmental crisis, and yet totally unaware of it. And when it comes to the environment, Gore argued, we're, we're all lotus eaters, uh, happy to continue our self-induced narco narcosis and blissfully aware of the current crisis and impending doomsday and telling it almost impossible to motivate uh, for transformative action. Now, why, while I'm happy to be back in the county of my ancestors, because my grandmother was from, from a charger from Killy Beggs Minister, um, and I spent, in fact, several years in Moville National School, uh, the truth I've come to share today in, is an inconvenient one in the, in the Gore sense. When it comes to higher education, we're all lotus eaters. We have been blind for far too long to the uh, funding crisis, a progressive erosion of funding, and the autonomy, progressive erosion of autonomy of our higher education institutions. And that's threatening now, I'd say, to, er to erode the very impressive gains that were made over the last decade or so. And if we ignore the crisis uh, to keep eating the lotus, uh, we'll ha that will have dire consequences for Ireland's uh, economy, uh, for polity, and, and indeed for, soci for, for society. Now, another uh, indisputable truth which Martin really alluded to is that developed countries are today competing as never before to create, uh, to attract and retain high-value value jobs. Uh, most of which are now knowledge are technology intensive. The knowledge economy and knowledge society are not aspirational, as some would give you the impression. I mean, they already exist, and they're represented, as you know, da daily in your mobile phone, your iPod or iPad, your new hybrid car, your newly installed solar panels, your new biologic arthritis medication, uh, and the changing face of foreign direct investment. Fifty percent of last year's investment was R&D-based. So it's with us. And Ireland's future economic success will depend on our ability to develop the talent pool to compete in this very fast-moving global game. The strength of our higher education system, and really that term itself is out of date, perhaps better, better termed the strength of our higher education research and innovation system, system will be critical uh, to this effort. Now, our universities must serve, must serve multiple roles. They must be agenda-shaping and agenda-shaking institutions. Society's guarantors that short-term considerations can never get, never be allowed to dominate the public discourse. They produce the, edu they are the educators of entrepreneurs, of managers, uh, of employees who will build and populate new companies uh, and services, particularly the knowledge-intensive ones. There will be important sources of new knowledge in their own right that will fuel these enterprises. They, and sometimes forgotten, will be a key determinant of Ireland's ability to absorb new knowledge and technology from elsewhere. They'll be strategic partners for knowledge-intensive organizations and themselves are direct contributors to the economy through the recruitment of uh, fee-paying international students. And then finally, they're significant co contributors, as you know, to the wider uh, cultural innovation and policy ecosystem and to echo some of Martin's comments to the values and assumptions that permeate it. So our universities need to be empowered to realize their full potential uh, and compete successfully in all of these domains. Now, if you doubt the validity of this statement, there, and there's, there are some who still do, I'd invite you to look at the competition, and not necessarily at the well-established uh, UK or US institutions, but the new kids of the block in Shanghai, in Singapore, in, in Shenzhen, in Bangalore. And when you look at them, you'll quickly understand both the threat and the opportunity uh, for a small open economy such as Ireland. And my purpose today isn't to be a scaremonger uh, or a purveyor of doom, we have enough of those, uh, but rather to be uh, an upbeat realist. And over the next 20 minutes or so, I want to first give you the evidence that the Irish universities have in be, indeed been at the vanguard internationally, both in terms of reform and in terms of performance. And it indeed could be taken as a model for reform of publicly funded institutions. But secondly, that there are major challenges to be addressed uh, if the hard-won success of the past decade or so is not to be uh, washed away in the metaphorical blink of an eye. 
And in this regard, the forthcoming report of the Higher Education Strategy Group, I think, is an opportunity uh, to either empower our universities in their quest for sustained international competitiveness, or, if we get it wrong, to shackle them with an under-resourced, uh, centrally controlled command and control uh, model that will condemn them uh, to mediocrity. And I think it's that black and white. So I base my case, uh, wherever possible, on internationally benchmarked uh, evidence. And I, I put it to you, actually, that too much of the debate in the popular press, uh, in the policy community, and indeed in academia, has been based on or driven by anecdote bias and memories often fading of uh, student days and decades gone by, rather than hard facts, detailed knowledge of what the competition is doing, and a vision for Ireland's future. And this does Ireland a disservice. It endangers the future of our children, and it, it has to change. Uh, it's time to put away the lotus. Now, we have a success story to tell, and I'd argue that we should be telling it. Uh, many of the opening sessions of this summer school focus on, on policy and regulatory failures uh, that have damaged our national finances and international reputation. But let's not tar the entire uh, nation with the same brush. Ireland has many contemporary success stories, and higher education is one of them. Uh, over the past decade or so, Ireland has launched a series of policy initiatives and investments in higher education that have been groundbreaking and in many cases transformative and have contributed to the success and to the resilience of major areas of our economy. And I'll just give you a few of them. The technology foresight exercise in the 90s, the partnership of government with Atlantic Philanthropies, the establishment of Science Foundation Ireland and the Humanities and Science Research Councils, and the Fourth Level Ireland Initiative, just, just to name but a few. Now, what's the evidence that these investments have made a difference? If you first consider the area of teaching and learning, and remember the, the, the baseline, that the uh, universities at the moment enjoy less funding per student, uh, fewer academic staff members per student, and fewer support staff per academic staff member than relevant UK comparators. Uh, but despite that, the university system, I put it to you, should be proud of the fact that we have a participation rate that's among the highest in the OECD. We've responded very rapidly to skills needs in ICT, for example, in the health professions. There's been significant uh, system-wide curriculum reform. With the quality assurance system, that is lauded in, in EU as a, as a model system. We have graduates that are ranked objectively as the most employable in the EU and a system that's ranked second in the EU in, by the 2010 ECOFIN study in terms of value for money. If you then turn to the, to the related area of research and innovation, again, some of the achievements, a transformation over the past decade of research infrastructure across the full range of disciplines, the humanities uh, and the sciences. The establishment of internationally competitive research programs, again, across the full range of disciplines, as well as a standing achievement in the cultural sphere, and just to name but one university-based artist, uh, Donegal man, Frank McGuinness. There's been a more than doubling of fourth-level masters and PhD students. A, the recruitment of a new cadre of early career, world-class early career and senior professors. Uh, a major step up in the quality and number of and impact of publications and more recently uh, patents uh, and campus companies. And a surge in substantive university industry relationships. And then finally, uh, rankings make people nervous but a striking improvement in the rankings of our universities, the majority of which are in the top 10%. We tend to fixate on the top 100, but remember the Times Higher only ranks the top 2,000 of over 5,000 universities internationally. So most of Ireland's universities are in that top 10%. Now all of these are, are crucial uh, to our future. The productive sector, and in particular technology-led firms, uh, are spearheading our return to export-led GDP growth and have been resilient during the downturn. And their health uh, and the health of our higher education and research systems are intimately linked. But, but as Martin said, uh, you have to run to stand still in this game. It is a global competition. There's a lot more to be done, and there are nettles to be grasped. The, prior to Ireland's economic meltdown uh, in, uh, a few years ago, the Irish universities were managing to enroll increasing number of students with a shrinking exchequer funding per student. But even then, I suppose that, that there were signs of strain when it came to quality. Now, the, the core problem is the state's funding model. What you may not know is that rather than the universities being paid a fixed sum of money, a fixed fee per student by the state, 
It's in fact a dilutional model. So, so simply put, if tomorrow we were to double the number of students in the system, we get half the fee per student. And you can imagine that's not sustainable. Over the past two to three years, this funding situation has, for understandable reasons, deteriorated at an alarming rate. The higher education sector has continued to take on extra thousands of students, of additional students, while absorbing a huge cut in funding. Uh, in UCD's case, that's been almost €2,000 per student. Uh, and all in the context, again, of a lower funding base by comparison with the international competition, because those are the ones that count. So it's not a sustainable situation. Uh, across the sector, important academic posts remain unfilled. Uh, support staff numbers have been cut. Library opening hours have been shortened. Uh, key teaching equipment is being replaced. Um, and IT upgrades and refurbishment projects are being deferred. And there's a general consensus that quality is now starting to be eroded and that the, the ranking of the universities will fall possibly precipitously with a consequent further damage to Ireland's reputation. And, and a dispassionate observer could argue that it would be irresponsible for the Irish universities to expand student numbers any further because to do so is to further dilute out the resource for our existing students. Uh, and yet we, we hear uh, bold statements that we're heading for 75% participation rates. The question is, is that doable? Is that sustainable without impacting on quality? Now, what I'd like to do today is, is to focus on, on solutions. Uh, because there are solutions, these uh, problems are solvable. They're within our control. The, the answer to the funding issue is, of course, a combination of efficiencies and revenue generation. Now, on the efficiency side, what the Irish universities managed to do really until this year was to increase student numbers and maintain quality, uh, for the most part by stripping out costs. Again, just to give you a UCD as a case study, uh, we reduced our total staff headcount by almost 8% um, so far. And in 2009-2010 academic year alone, uh, stripped out 27 million from our cost pace. That's in addition to the um, state-imposed salary cuts. But as you can imagine, further cuts of this magnitude are simply not possible without doing long-term damage to the system in terms of quality and productivity. On the revenue generation side of the equation, uh, the universities are prohibited from charging tuition fees to Irish students who can well afford to pay. And I know, Minister, you're not want to go to, you don't want to hear this, but I've got to personalize it. As I, I'm a father of three uh, teenagers who I can afford and I'm happy to pay, well, happy maybe, just about, happy to pay about €6,000 each uh, to a private secondary school. When they enter UCD or, or another Irish university in about four years' time, they'll pay a modest student services charge, and they'll probably ask me to buy them a car with the balance. So we have a funding problem and a parking problem. Not good. Uh, meanwhile, the tax paid, meanwhile, the tax paid by less well-off parents will continue to subsidize university education for better off, including my children. And just that system is not fair, in my view. Universities do generate significant income, significant non-exchequer income, from postgraduate students and international students. But at the moment, uh, state-imposed restrictions on uh, staff recruitment and remuneration limit our ability to expand, expand this. Uh, and there is room for expansion. And again, just to give you an idea of the scale, UCD currently generates about 80 million in non-exchequer fee, fee income. Uh, the wider Irish economy benefits by about a similar amount because these same students pay rent and they have day-to-day -day living expenses and probably on about a one-to-one. -one. To grow the, ac the ac activity, we need to be able to uh, employ more staff, academic and support staff, uh, and to incentivize staff to take on leadership roles. And we're currently constrained uh, by the state from doing both. Uh, and this is, I put it to you, completely counterproductive and it needs to be sorted out. So in my last few minutes, Chairman, the, the, I mentioned the Higher Education Strategy Group. And this is an opportunity. It's an, an opportunity, as I would see it, to solve these problems, to empower the Irish universities to play their full part in Ireland's recovery. It's an opportunity to celebrate Ireland's success in this area, set out a vision for the, vision for the future, and, and tackle the issues, grasp the nettles head on. And in the last few minutes, I'd just like to, if I was writing that report, and I'm going to send a copy of this to Colin Hunt, the Chairman, if I was writing the report, I'd be hoping for the following maybe 10 points. Uh, first, the overall quality and performance of the higher education system is best served by a diversity of institutions. 
enabled by institutional autonomy and operating within an environment characterized by a healthy balance of collaboration and competition. Uh, the international evidence overwhelmingly links institutional autonomy with both institutional and system-wide performance. And there's little evidence for the, 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 the opposite model of, of state command and control. Uh, second, the humanities, the sciences, and the professional disciplines each, of course, have valuable and distinctive roles to play in the development of our students, the economy, and society. That's a given. But it's at the convergence of disciplines that so much of the groundbreaking work is taking place in both teaching and research. And with this in mind, I hope that disciplinary diversity will be recognized as a strength, uh, particularly in large research-intensive universities where interdisciplinary scholarship should be encouraged. Third, and again to pick up on one of Martin's themes, our universities have a key role to play in priming Ireland for success in an increasing globalized and interconnected world. Uh, the graduates, not, necessarily, not even of the future, the graduates of today will routinely uh, live and work across borders, whether physically or virtually. Research, whether it be public or private, is already increasingly about uh, or spread across collaborative international networks. The success of indigenous companies will be uh, de de determined by their ability to uh, operate from Ireland, but again across a, a, a global customer base. And finally, it's very likely that uh, an increasing proportion of foreign direct investment will indeed come from Asian companies seeking to establish a European base. So our universities, our entire higher education system should be encouraged to further develop strong international collaborative links, student mobility opportunities, researcher opportunities, and indeed overseas campus. And again, I'd echo Martin's comment on the importance of an Asian language, and I'd certainly suggest to you that given the increasing importance of China across the globe, that as many people in our society should have access to Chinese language and culture as possible. Uh, fourth, the same way that se free second level in the 60s and expansion of third level in the 90s and 2000s really gave us a step up in national competitiveness, the development of top quality fourth level masters of PhD training is the next wave. And it's essential that we continue the work in this area to sustain our uh, international competitiveness, develop that fourth level brand, which most countries have not, have not paid attention to, and develop a complementary suite or portfolio of lifelong learning and continuing professional development opportunities, again, across the whole range of, of, of sectors. Fifth, just turning to research funding. The, I, I put it to you that it's imperative that Ireland increases its investment in R&D to the 3% recommended by the EU and, and the OECD. The, the importance of a strong foundation in discovery research in both the humanities and technology disciplines, I think, should be uh, stressed as being of value in its own right, but also as key to future-proofing applied research. Research laboratories, they're not just the source of knowledge, discoveries, and technologies. They are very much now the classrooms for fourth-level training. And furthermore, the strength of a nation's indigenous R&D sector. Uh, is a key determinant of a nation's ability to absorb discoveries, knowledge, and technologies from elsewhere. So research is not cheap, but there are few of many investments that yield that type of return on a consistent basis across so many sectors. Six institutional and sectoral frameworks uh, should be developed to mainstream innovation as the third pillar of university activity alongside teaching and research and indeed to strengthen the links between those three domains and maximize translation of research to uh, new products, services, jobs, and policies. Uh, and this will involve system-wide change, further system-wide change, uh, undergraduate level, fourth level, technology transfer, and new types of partnerships with knowledge-intensive organizations. Uh, and this is precisely what Trinity and UCD are doing under their uh, Innovation Alliance umbrella. And Minister, we were delighted to uh, receive funding for that initiative only last week. The final few points, our, education, uh, our higher education institutions can play an increasing valuable role in challenging the assumptions uh, upon which public and political policy is built. And perhaps now more than ever, we need that type of challenge. And implicit within this recommendation should be acknowledgement of the valuable role 
of the universities as a source of the contrarian view. No matter how uncomfortable and challenging that view may be to government, to the Chatterati, and indeed even to university presidents, dare I say it. Um, the, the strategy can't, though, have credibility. It cannot have credibility if it fudges the issue of funding. So I certainly hope that a funding model is proposed that's transparent in terms of the funding, the fee per student, not the dilutional model. That includes a financial contribution from those who can afford to pay, either up front or uh, on a loan basis that they'll pay back when they reach a certain uh, income level later, if the state can't afford to fund us at the levels enjoyed by the relevant international comparators. And finally, that it should recognize that the cost of running an internationally recognized research university, research intensive university, is different from that of running a predominantly uh, teaching uh, institution. And just a word of caution again on participation. If participation rates are increased without addressing the funding issue, the erosion of funding, the quality of our system will be, will be eroded. Ireland's brightest and best will undoubtedly start to ask the question, access to what? And if the answer is a second-rate system, they'll leave for greener pastures and many won't come back. So that is a serious threat. Secondly, our attractiveness to talented, fee-paying international students will be, will be diminished. So you can get quickly into a, virtuous, or into a vicious cycle downwards. Finally, the, the universities must have the operational autonomy to recruit and manage the performance of their staff uh, and to incentivize staff to take on leadership roles. Now, you might think that's intuitive, but, but it's not the case at the moment. And too much of the discussion in this area has been on the management of underperforming staff. Now, it goes without saying that this is an issue, but I put it is, is, is greatly exaggerated. Uh, and I'm sure it has to be tackled, but a far more challenging issue for me, and I suspect for my fellow university presidents, is management of excellence. It's the incentivizing, the reward, the retention of the very top performers, performers an elite group of highly mobile uh, uh, academic leaders, entrepreneurs, and innovators who will be central uh, to Ireland's success. Second best Mediocre is just no good in, in this knowledge-intensive game. So in the field of higher education and research, Ireland has a great story to tell. It is a it's a story of reform, of transformation and innovation uh, that has attracted worldwide attention. Uh, but the worry is that perhaps an unforeseen side effect of the clamor for regulation, which of course is appropriate for certain sectors, is now, start, because it's a one-size-fits-all approach that's been adopted, is starting to shackle initiative and innovation in a sector, higher education, which until recently had been very successful and a real showcase for Ireland. The report of the, of the Innovation Task Force uh, sends a strong message for the future. And it, it, it underscores the fact that our success will depend on flexibility, agility, and willingness to constantly seek out and meet new challenges and at appropriate times to be willing to take risks and occasionally fail. I'd hope that I have, in this in a short period, shown you that the Irish universities have a track record of achievement and are hungry to do more. And for sure the challenges, there are challenges that have to be met, uh, and they've got to be met head on and as a matter of urgency, but they are solvable. And if we, if we solve them, we, we, we will secure Ireland's uh, future over generations to come. However inconvenient, uh, to keep eating the lotus is just not an option. Thanks very much.